Okay, good. Maybe I can start and then I will pass the floor to our moderator today, Dr. Sefia Gentunes, that is uh, with us from Lisbon. Uh, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, welcome to this webinar on digital transition organized by the Embassy of Portugal in Helsinki during the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union with the support of the Camões Institute of Cooperation and Language and some partners that I will identify at the end. Uh, we are living indeed during difficult times and the pandemic has highlighted that we need to find and apply solutions to overcome and share challenges and to recover. Uh, as you well know, the Portuguese presidency is being mobilized under several priorities, uh, synthesized in the cent by the central idea that now is time to deliver a fair, green and digital recovery. Today, we will center our webinar in one of the priorities of our presidency, uh, discussing ways how to build a digitally resilient Europe. Digitalization of our European society is clearly nowadays seen as something more and more important. Digital technologies bring new and easier ways to learn, to entertain, to work, to live, as well as new freedoms and rights. But digitalization can also create new challenges, new threats and new responsibilities. On March 9th, the European Commission, in its communication uh, entitled 2030 Digital Compass, the European Way for the Digital Decade, addressed in a very deep and constructive form these opportunities, challenges and responsibilities, identifying possible ways and goals to shape Europe's digital future during the next decade, preparing Europe for a world that empowers people and businesses and that is shaped around a human-centered, sustainable and more prosperous approach. Having in mind this document and the upcoming policy discussion on the digital compass, compass by the Telecom Council that will take place on the 4th of June, we decided to organize this webinar on digital transition addressing the four cardinal points identified by the European Commission Digital Compass in order to explore and discuss ways to make the present decade a truly digital decade and promote the digital transition across the European Union and to achieve a digitally skilled population and highly skilled digital professionals, secure, performant and sustainable digital infrastructures, digital transformation of businesses and digitalizations of public services. But we cannot forget the critically important and cross-cutting nature of the issue of digital rights. The Portuguese presidency uh, is aiming to sign a political declaration on the human dimension of digital, the Lisbon Declaration, at a Digital Decade Assembly on the 1st of June, as a contribution to the goals of the Digital Compass. And we would also like to take this opportunity to hear the participants' views on this subject today. The Portuguese Presidency is aiming to make substantial progress in several other digital files, like the Digital Services Package, and the Data Governance Act, e-privacy, roaming regulation, etc. All initiatives that are instrumental to the 2030 Digital Compass. But as you can imagine, this will be a long process that will not be over during this semester. Anyway, we hope that we can give a boost to this debate and that today's webinar will help in that direction. Let me finish by thanking all the speakers and partners from Estonia, from Finland, and from Portugal that are joining us today. Ms. Timo Roos, Ms. Ayn Avixo, Ms. Mr. Yuzi Erlin, Mr. Tuli Parenson, Ms. Laura Alenius, Dr. Luisa Ribeiro Lopes, and Dr. José Pedro Antunes that will be our moderator. Thank you especially to Dr. José Pedro Antunes that uh, will have a lot of work today. And also my colleagues here at the Embassy making this timely event possible and I'm sure very useful. So I give now the floor to the José Pedro Antunes and I wish you a very good and great discussion. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. And uh, in the first place, I, I would like to uh, thank you for the invitation and to be here. Um, my name is José Pedro. I'm from INCODE 2030. For those who don't know INCODE 2030, this is an initiative. It's, um, it's part of the Portuguese government ambitions plan to address digital transition. 
of this plan, uh, Portugal Digital, that, that is the name, have an important signature, which is moving forward, moving with purpose, the purpose to accelerate Portugal without leaving anyone behind. To achieve this purpose, we need to empower people with digital skills. We need to guarantee the digital inclusion of everyone, in particular women, but also those for, uh, who, for social and uh, economic reasons, are less educated. We believe that digital inclusion is the better way for the social and economic inclusion of everyone. We still have a long way to go. I believe that um, this is one of the, our bigger challenges, uh, qualify citizens in uh, digital skills and leave no one behind. Um, Portugal, like you said before, Mr. Ambassador, Portugal, Europe and the world need a green digital and inclusive transformation. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to uh, go with no more uh, delays to the first uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Timu Roos. Uh, I'm sorry if uh, I didn't pronounce the name correctly, but uh, uh, I, I promise the next uh, time I will do it. So Mr. Timo Roos is a professor of computer science and artificial intelligence and data science at the University of Helsinki. He also the leader of the information complexity and learning research group leader uh, of the AI education program in the Finnish Center for AI. Uh, Mr. Timo Roos, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Pedro. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, uh, for the uh, for the invitation to, um, to present. Um, and uh, very 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 good morning, uh, or well, almost afternoon, uh, wherever uh, our audiences might be located at this at this time. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so I, I really um, found very uh, much to like in the introductory remarks, and I feel that there is a some sort of uh, special opportunity with the Portuguese presidency uh, now following uh, after a, a little while the, the Finnish presidency, two countries that are perhaps not the biggest in size uh, in EU, but uh, but probably uh, will uh, punch above our weight uh, in terms of what the what the presidency can achieve. I, I kind of symbolically we are looking at that Europe from the opposite ends and, and I think this gives us a good uh, Sort of um, supporting uh, supporting visions of uh, where we should go, and I especially liked the uh, the topic of um, digitally skilled citizens and uh, uh, and also professionals. I will try to share my screen with a few just a few slides. Um, uh, just a sec. Here we should. Uh, whoops. There, uh, can you see the, the PowerPoint slide now? Yes, perfect. Excellent. So indeed, the, the title of, of my presentation is Digital Skilled Citizens and uh, Highly Skilled Digital Professionals. Uh, and I was already introduced, so I don't have to do that uh, too much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still Tem Roos, and uh, thank you, Jose Pedro, for the very excellent uh, pronunciation of, of my name. Uh, so uh, I think it's it's kind of interesting to um, put uh, the digital transition, uh, AI, uh, all all the sort of uh, big uh, transitions and uh, even disruptions uh, that we are now facing in a in a in a national perspective, um, and then uh, sort of see that the European perspective is is composed of, of national strategies that are somehow aligned and and at at least starting to be aligned. Uh, the Finnish uh, AI strategy uh, is uh, sort of, in my view, particularly interesting from the point of view of inclusivity. So uh, perhaps that has something to do with us being a relatively small country and always sort of making sure that we we can't kind of afford to leave anybody behind. Uh, and that's that's the best interest of the of the citizens, but it's also best interest in terms of our competitiveness and our our productivity and, and growth and, and so on. And I, I think that's that's nicely outlined in the strategy, uh, which has a number of um, uh, objectives, uh, among which uh, I've highlighted here uh, a few a few of the most interesting ones. Uh, one, uh, the use of AI, competitiveness to the use of AI, 
Uh, of course, also top level expertise, which is number four and on that list. I've selected a few of them um, and, and adoption of AI uh, and uh, collaborations again. Uh, making sure that uh, making sure with that we make the make best use of the all the resources that we have in the in the society, but be that be that uh, industry, be that uh, 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 public organizations or or just the citizens uh, activity. Um, and the way uh, I personally have been sort of trying to uh, follow this strategy. Uh, and contribute to that uh, uh, with uh, with my team at the University of Helsinki and uh, and the Finnish Center for AI is to try to make AI and digitalization um, how should I say that uh, more understandable and approachable so that again that inclusivity would be possible and I think that's that is uh, extremely important um, of course not only in Finland but throughout uh, the Europe you know throughout Europe. And, and the whole world. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, my sort of argument towards that is that the uh, the ignorance that we might have towards any important transition in the society would prevent us from fruit, prevents our citizens um, and our organizations and our decision, even the decision makers, from taking part in the discourse that we need to go through to to follow a democratic decision making process and for AI or you can you know you, you can replace digitalization in terms of or in place of AI artificial intelligence here um, uh, these are tools uh, and th and these tools can be used for good or bad but I will never I, I've made a specific point of not putting a full stop at the end of that sentence uh, because I think it's always important that we continue that sentence by noting that even though AI or digitalization uh, are not positive or negative as such, they're not also neutral. There are important decisions that we need to be able to reach, uh, uh, which are not technological. So they're not some things that only academics can study at engineering departments or computer science departments. These are really political decisions. And I think this is worth uh, worth kind of highlighting and, and pausing uh, um, around and making sure that we understand the implications of this. So the in my view, the implications of that, uh, that uh, fact, that the decisions that we need to reach about how to react, how to, um, how to be resilient uh, in, 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 in this transition, uh, is that we, we need to uh, have a common understanding of the phenomenon and then we need to enter that discourse and then we need to go through the, the decision making processes. OK, so how do we enable that? Um, I have I have sort of for each uh, kind of every one of us, there there's different things that we should do. So if like most of us are experts, of course, on something. Right? Well, I guess everybody is expert on something. So I'm not sort of saying here that is this only a per pertains to, let's say, professors at academic institutions it can be uh, experts working in the industry but wh whoever we are whatever we have learned about let's say digitalization it is important that we reach out and we offer our knowledge to anybody else who is interested to learn about it and of course to do that so often we we convey our me messages through uh, journalistic media uh, and, and journalists need to be also sort of behaving responsibly and, and enabling us to convey, you know, knowledgeable content or, or fact based content and dump the, the clickbaits, so to speak. Uh, the, the consumers of that, that um, knowledge or uh, the, anybody who is interested in learning about it needs to be have needs to have the basic ability to to separate, you know, let's say hyped up or otherwise sort of exaggerated or false or fake uh, content from the real one. So that that, that is a really tri tricky, uh, tricky problem. And, and we need to work on people's ability to be critical about the, you know, what they're learning about, especially online. And everything, all of that is going to be built or has to be built on education. And um, and I'm sort of I'm not only talking about uh, you know, again, academic institutions or school systems, but we need to have lifelong learning. We need to have 
uh, continuing education efforts. Uh, we need to have open education on all levels and for all. And for this, uh, a particular action that, uh, that is actually um, now offered to all EU citizens as a part of the, um, let's say, the immaterial gift that the Finnish EU presidency gave at the end of the term to all EU countries is a course on AI or digitalization. It's a, quite a broad, uh, broad view on AI. And this is, a, this is an online course that was launched already in 2018. Uh, it's already got something like 680,000 participants uh, you know, throughout Europe, throughout the, the, the world. And now, uh, after the uh, EU presidency, uh, we decided, uh, the Finnish government decided to invest uh, in, in this program being translated in all official EU languages with the support of the EU, uh, European Commission um, translation services. And this is really for all and it's for, for uh, you know, it's open, available uh, online for free and it doesn't require any coding or mathematics uh, skills. It's more like AI literacy, uh, trying to understand how do you learn uh, about AI and digitalization. And this is this is now uh, have been, has been very successful, both in terms of the numbers and the reception that the, uh, the users have um, given and feedback that we're receiving. And it was, um, uh, for instance, nominated as a finalist in the Innovation and Innovation in Politics Awards last year. Last year. Uh, and now I've uh, I should update the list with a bunch of more flags uh, with the with the countries um, countries local initiatives we have brilliant uh, partners in every EU country, including uh, Portugal, and uh, we are co collaborating with them to do the, let's say, the, the legwork, the, the grassroots uh, work to reach, uh, read the, reach uh, as wide audiences as we can. And we have indeed have been very happy to reach uh, quite the diverse audience in terms of the gender, in terms of the age, in terms of people's educational background, and, and so on and so forth. So again, for all. and. Um, not only, uh, let's say, people who are already familiar with digitalization. Uh, and, and we have, a, I, I will skip this, but uh, there's a, there's a follow-up course where then those of uh, the users who get excited and think that they might become AI contributors instead of just being AI consumers or citizens in a world where there is AI everywhere, uh, there is an opportunity to dig deeper and start building that professional skill set that is required to contribute uh, in AI and, you know, boost uh, productivity and uh, all those other benefits that we get. But the, but the main point that I wanted to make is that, you know, through the basic course uh, offering that, let's say, the citizenship skills in the, in the digital era. Uh, but any, again, you know, you can continue and you can sort of start finding professional uh, skills that you can apply uh, to to create new innovations and hopefully uh, boost uh, the growth of the and competitiveness of the European economy. So just to summarize this uh, sort of uh, brief uh, brief uh, presentation, I uh, sort of very very simply put, I would say that AI and digitalization are some things that concern every single one of us and our parents and our family and our our friends. And loved ones, so we should we should sort of uh, embrace it as as a fun topic, and we should learn it, and then uh, after that we can form an info informed opinion about it, and that is the first step into getting involved in the in the decision making process, in the shaping the digital future uh, of of the of the continent, and and I think that uh, that that needs to be somehow done in an inclusive. Manner. That's the, the, that. That I think is the main uh, main requirement to to creating the the European way with AI and, and digitalization. Thank you. Uh, Timo, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we will have uh, some Q and A uh, at the end of the of the session. Uh, we have we, have, we will have time for the the questions. Please. Uh, uh, if you have uh, any question, just uh, just send us uh, that question, and then we'll try to answer at the end of the of the session. Timo, thank you very much for for your presentation. Uh, for sure, we will have uh, some questions for you later on. 
on the session. Um, so uh, our next uh, next guest is um, Mr. Ayn um, Avixo. Again, sorry if I didn't pronounce the name correctly. And um, he's from the Guardian uh, Time, a Estonian company leading the development of the COVID-19 digital vaccination certificate with more than 20 years of experience in the digital technologies and health innovation. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, I know so, and your pronunciation once again was uh, perfect. Uh, uh, I'm uh, um, uh, substituting a little bit for my colleague uh, Lucas Illness, uh, who just had a, uh, a growth in his family. But I try to expand on the area, not just uh, from the healthcare, but in a larger sense, how do we understand the, uh, the needs uh, of uh, secure, performant and sustainable digital infrastructures? And uh, what, what, what do we mean by that? Um, so uh, I will speak very briefly and I hope that there will be uh, opportunity to uh, go more in depth if there's an interest in the Q&A session that at least three components uh, are needed. So there needs to be some way how I identify as an, uh, either an individual or uh, an, uh, a legal entity in the digital space, as we do this in the physical world. There needs to be a way how the data is being exchanged between those entities. And then also, um, since the exchange of information is slightly different than in the physical domain, uh, reliability has to be built uh, uh, in order for, for that uh, data exchange uh, to be something that we can base our actions upon. So when we talk about identity, um, we think uh, in Estonia and uh, now we see the increasing number of countries joining who say that actually the digital identity can be even stronger uh, than what we know the physical uh, identity. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, there is ability uh, to uh, uh, well basically in, in, in Estonia uh, we believe and uh, Finland is the same in many other countries that in addition to my name as Ein Avixo, I have also a, a number. Uh, and this number is basically the digital representation of myself. So in Estonia, the digital identity is not a private or personal information. Well, not more than, than my name, uh, so that um, I'm using it uh, in, in, in the same manner. And uh, now, 17 years, 99% uh, of people do have it. Uh, there are uh, uh, said there were 70 percent of active users and that is pre-COVID so I don't have the recent data at hand but I do believe that the number of people and especially we see this uh, among the the elderly people uh, have started to uh, to use uh, their their digital identity for instance uh, you know the, the shopping uh, which was very difficult uh, during COVID time to do uh, to do uh, in the physical means and many of them have discovered and there are even kind of campaigns um, uh, that uh, their uh, uh, children or grandchildren or just um, NGOs are helping also elderly people uh, to uh, define the ways how you can execute uh, your digital identity. We have different modes to do that and uh, there is already six years of e-residency which means that also the citizens of other and legal citizens of other countries can actually have their digital identity, which can take part of the European uh, economic community. The second bit is, is exchange of, of data. Uh, we in Estonia are very strong believers of distributed exchange. So that, um, which is, um, uh, as I say, uh, maybe the easiest comparison that this is alternative to is you know let's move everybody on the cloud certainly you you can and you will use services also in the cloud 
but the idea that uh, um, if uh, certain entities would like to co uh, communicate between themselves, then all, all of them have to move you know, to the same cloud provider. I, I don't know if, if some of you did follow, but there was a big fight in, in, in the US, you know, which cloud provider will start providing those services to the, to the US government. I think the equivalent in Estonia would be probably also not, not feasible. So instead, if the identities are securely possible uh, to uh, to be uh, managed and maintained. Well, in our case, we're using XROAD, uh, but we know already now from the collaboration with the WHO that this technology in itself isn't really the, the main point here. The main idea, and perhaps Tuli will, will mention that, is that there is a, an, a trust framework and then the services are kind of separated from them so that the services can freely flow between those identified entities and the and the exchange of information can be distributed so there is no need for centralized nodes even though you can always you know centralize part of the information but again you will you can always kind of um, combine data together it's very difficult if data is already somewhere in the in a centralized location to kind of compartmentalize or, or distribute that back to, to their original users. And this is uh, what we uh, have built out of necessity. So one very important um, argument for, for going in this distributed manner is that actually it does save money and time. And this was uh, you know, for now like 20 years ago already, why this approach was chosen instead of uh, the other alternatives that were available already at that time as well. Now, and, and last but not least, so if the identities uh, are there, uh, and then there is also an infrastructure uh, uh, to exchange the information. Sorry, I did omit the physical infrastructure, which is certainly important. So I am a kind of a data person. So yes, uh, there probably is a, a, a very necessary discussion of the last mile, especially in the countries which are sparsely populated like Estonia, Finland and many others. There is also you know, security discussions about you know, what equipment uh, needs to be there, but I will not discuss about this today as, as I'm not an expert on those fields. Uh, but the uh, uh, CIA, if you will, um, uh, concept uh, of uh, uh, integrity, uh, availability and confidentiality is also what, again, there is no one technology that can provide that, but it needs to be there. So there has to be ways how certain information is only allowed to be seen by uh, people authorized to do so or by organizations authorized to do so. And I mentioned we do have for that uh, the uh, systems available. Then you need to have this information to be available. And that is what we use uh, the X road. And then the integrity bar tells that uh, if the data uh, artifact or, or data asset is presented to you, you have to be certain that this is uh, the truthful information. Uh, and, and that is what and how we use uh, the case of blockchain for. And that is uh, uh, one of the technologies that I work at, at Garta. Now, last but not least, uh, um, again, these numbers, maybe absolute numbers, are not that impressive to larger countries. But the trend is the most important bit. So wherever I go and describe, you know, what does it take in order to build truly digital societies? Uh, the first kind of, uh, part is to understand that it is a journey. So it's a little bit like if you imagine like a fax machine. So if you are the only one who has the fax machine, there is not much you can do with that. So as soon as you plug in those identifiable entities that can then start securely exchanging information, uh, the creativity of, of people and those organizations really does not know limitations. So even like in 2017, uh, we already had a lot of uh, digital services available. Uh, you, you, can, you can see that at some point it starts explode exponentially uh, when you make this, this available. So that uh, it, is, it is something that uh, uh, I even say doesn't really matter where do you start from, 
And, and that is why I think that this uh, um, collaboration with the uh, at the European level, so I've been involved uh, uh, through the eHealth network, building the digital infrastructure to make those uh, COVID certificates available across the Europe. I must say I am impressed about the, the speed with which the European countries can collaborate if, they, if there is a great need for that. And, and really, we might not get the ideal service, but the mere fact that we are building something which is empowering people, and this will be my last slide, this is what, what is, uh, you know, has to be kept in mind. So that uh, when I was uh, uh, in, in a similar manner leading the EU presidency on behalf of the Estonian country in the digital health domain, my kind of goal within the six months was to change the question that people ask when they come to countries like Estonia and Finland and other digital advanced countries is, is it safe? you know, to make this kind of data available. I think by today that question has changed. So the question is, how can we make it safely so that maybe, I don't know uh, about the, the getting married or divorced. This is still something that I would like to do in person, but selling one's real estate actually also could be one of those services that I hope in Estonia and why not elsewhere could be done online because we do trust because we can identify ourselves and because there are those infrastructures that enable us to exchange that information. So thank you. That will be my contribution for the discussion and open to uh, questions later on if there is an opportunity and interest. Thank you. OK, Havik, so thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have uh, for sure one, one question for you regarding the, uh, the, your, your presentation uh, and regarding COVID-19 but I will wait for the end of the, of the session to, to ask you that. So um, our next speaker, and thank you very much. Uh, your, our next uh, uh, speaker uh, will be Mr. Yussi Herlin, uh, Vice Chairman of the Board of Cone Corporation and Chair of the Steering Group of the Finnish Programme Artificial Intelligence 4.0, um, whose purpose is to speed up digitalization of uh, Finnish uh, businesses. Um, Mr. Yusit, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, uh, and thank you, Your Excellency, for the for this opportunity to to address these issues. I am, I think, still not able to share my own screen. The Teams does not give me that possibility, so I have to ask Mr. De Silva Carvalho if he can present my material uh, for me. Let's see if we are able to get the slides up. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So we have we have the material up there. So um, I want to talk about two different cases. So I want to talk about, like like mentioned in the introduction, about the, the AI 4.0 program that we have just launched here in Finland. And then I want to go into uh, a bit more of a case example of how we have been digitalizing and what have been the drivers and what have been the outcomes of, of the digitalization journey that we are on uh, at Kone as well. So uh, next slide, please. I will start by talking about uh, the, the AI 4.0 program. So this is a, you know, a look at the, the Digital Economy and Society Index or DESI. So for the past years, we've been a digital runner. Uh, for we've been scoring very high, and 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 as you can see, even being at the, the European top of the of the DESI, and then we have also, like Mr. Roos mentioned earlier, on like, but the example of the elements of AI, we've been, we've been a leader and a really an active player in in several uh, global AI initiatives. But like if you if you know what, like if you ask a Finn, like hey, how do you feel about this fact that Finland is the happiest nation on earth? The Finn will probably say that. There must be some sort of error in the calculations, and maybe there's a little bit of the same is true here. That that even though if you look at this index, it looks like we are doing quite okay, but clearly further efforts for establishing a truly digital economy uh, are still required. And also maybe looking looking longingly at our southern neighbor and the the way that they have managed this uh, this um, transformation in there. But if you look at, if you think about Finland's development in, in R&D investments, the employment rate, industrial productivity, the development of these things has been really not on par with our peer countries in the last five to ten years. 
And then if you look at more urgent crises, for example, we're contending with recovery from COVID-19 and we're talking about monumental ecological and, and climate related challenges at the moment. So clearly there is still uh, a lot of work to do. Next slide, please. So what we are now doing is we're taking the next step in the field of AI by having just kicked off the AI 4.0 program. And maybe to, to talk about the name a little bit. So since the preparation of the, and the launch of the program, we've been guided by the idea that the most significant areas of growth and business development effects of AI will become apparent. Uh, so more as a part of a greater industrial reform. So with me, this means that the effects are visible as, as part of an economic, technological and societal transformation, which is commonly known as the fourth industrial revolution. And you can see it here in relation to the other, the previous industrial revolutions. And we're still very much in the, in the process of going through the fourth industrial revolution at the moment. And it will be continuing to renew and reform economic structures and also the process of value creation. Next slide, please. So here in a nutshell is the is the uh, the, the core of the uh, AI 4.0 uh, program. If I go a little bit through our four main targets. Uh, firstly, the program will be supporting the digital transition of what we call high potential SMEs. So those are just sort of right behind the curve, maybe not the ones that are already fully digital and, and embracing digital, but the ones who are sort of the second the runners up, so they have a lot, a lot of potential, but do, they have not, not taken the decisive step yet. So we can help them benefit from the digital excellence of the cutting edge uh, corporations and startups. And we believe strongly that, that digital innovation is a lot about experimentation. So what we should do is really ex embrace uh, experimentation, you know, have an up enabling legislation, legal sandboxes, bureaucracy light targeted investment support for new technologies, education system providing talented people with, with wide cross pollinated perspective, referring back to back to the first presentation. Uh, one Nordic example of this sort of uh, collaboration and experimental collaboration is Combined, which is a, a network of Finnish and Swedish large companies and, and they have we have our own uh, innovation innovation platform and an own sort of startup cooperation uh, initiative as well. Secondly, the program will also encourage cross-sectoral and international cooperation. So we want to increase Finland's effectiveness in the implementation of EU's AI data and industrial strategies. And by sharing our best practices and innovative ideas, we have the potential to make the most of our advancements in Finland and we can be uh, a more central influencer in the European Union. Thirdly, we will strengthen the Finnish AI leadership uh, by targeting investments in the development and deployment of leading technologies and accelerating excellence, especially in AI. But like, as you know, AI is more than just one technology. It's a combination. It's a cross section of uh, several technologies. And an essential part of this objective is to promote the funding and investments needed uh, for the development and implementation of, of high impact technologies and digitalization. And the fourth and final target of the program is to make the most of innovative technologies uh, and encourage to uh, to utilize them in the green and digital twin transition of the Finnish and uh, Finnish economy, and of course maybe the world economy uh, more widely. The twin transition is essential uh, for boosting sustainable growth as well as resilience and reliability of our economies in, uh, in more widely, and. I believe strongly that in the global game, if you look at the globally, the game, uh, European companies are trustworthy and we're ahead of uh, ahead of the pack in sustainability, both in climate and ethical topics. And thus, you know, the twin transition is uh, is a positioning we should really continue to promote and, and push very actively. But, you know, it's it's safe to say that we are in the middle of this uh, digital transformation still. Lots of cool technologies and, and applications now, but we are. no one has really decided the game, even though lots of big moves are being made. No one's won or lost, so we should make sure that the digital penetrates rapidly uh, deeper into the very core of our businesses and then the European companies can capture the opportunity by, continue, uh, by combining um, existing strengths. 
uh, with new technologies. Next slide, please. So that was a very brief and concise uh, look into the into the program uh, AI 4.0. So I'll spend a couple of minutes to talk about what we have done uh, at Kone in terms of digitalization. Next slide, please. And the way to start is by having to look at the mission because it really should start there. You shouldn't start with with the technology you have. You shouldn't start with what what is the next product you can uh, create. But to really look at the mission, what is the mission of the company? And for Kone, the mission is to improve the flow of urban life. Uh, we do this by understanding people flow in and between buildings, and thus we can make people's journeys safe, convenient, and reliable. And to put simply, we make cities better places to live. And this should be the starting point for thinking thinking about uh, digital uh, transformation. Next slide, please. Um, very con uh, concisely and briefly, I we can condense with the big changes in the in our marketplace. So especially the urban and the construction industry into three key changes in in customer needs and expectations. Firstly, smart and sustainable continue to be themes that our customers look to look for within the building space, as well as uh, in the city context more widely. And this has only been accelerated by the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, smart buildings and smart technologies, they bring more flexibility and they help our customers uh, manage uh, uncertainty. And, and citizens expect to be living in a smart, clean and, and convenient environment. The role of accessibility, uh, safety and, and, for example, public transportation is uh, highlighted very much. And adaptable, the customer experience and the user experience uh, provided by these solutions, it has to be or it increasingly should be adapted or personalized in a in a mass customization way so that it suits and matches a, a certain segment or maybe even a certain person uh, uh, driven needs. And the needs that I'm talking about, they'll in increasingly be satisfied by solutions combining traditional and non-digital elements uh, with digital elements. We are moving very much towards a digital plus physical industry. Anyone who has a car that has been bought in the last couple of years understand that the car is now also very much a, a digital plus physical product. And thirdly, responsiveness, uh, responsive and convenient. So our customers continue to expect ex excellent responsiveness. It has to be like this, expertise, proactiveness as well, and we need to serve them in the, in the best possible way. And we have to be very convenient uh, that it, convenience is a key expectation for our customers ex, uh, engaging with us. Uh, next slide, please. So one way in which at Kone this is now all coming to into a into a solution is through our DX class elevator offering. And what DX means is digital experience. In brief, uh, all of our future elevators will be. Uh, well, elevators are platforms in a very traditional way, but now we're taking, we're adding another meaning to the word platform. So in the future, elevators are also platforms in the digital sense. So we're connecting, we're connecting more than floors. We're actually, uh, we're an open platform for, for our own uh, value added services, for our customers value added services, or for third party value added services that what they can do within the, the smart building ecosystem. Uh, we can create value those with connected people for solutions, differentiate with our user experience, as well as really take the partnering to the next level uh, for smarter buildings. Next slide, please. And on the service side of things, so if that was the, 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 what our equipment will be in the future, already things that we are doing on the on the services side is is selling maintenance uh, with tailored contracts according to their individual needs instead of saying that here's the basic here's the plus here's the platinum now we can order a much more a wider variety of services based on needs and this is what i talked about adaptability and, and customization and uh, and we can also bring predictability uh, safety and transparency by using connectivity technologies, by using sensors within our equipment, and so we can predict when the equipment needs to be serviced. Uh, next slide, please. And actually, I think in the interest of time, I will go all the way to the next slide or to my conclusion slide. So I will bring it back to this because, you know, this is how we see that corner, but I also very much believe that this is a wider phenomenon in the business. Um, not B2B, but or not just B2C, but also the B2B world. So we are looking for uh, a safe and sustainable uh, path 
and, and smart path of least resistance. So if something makes our lives easier, we grab onto it. But if you look at food delivery, for example, it has made things so much easier that we, it has really uh, exploded as a, uh, uh, as, a, as a market, for example. So if there's a way to make things easier uh, and just, just work, to a person for for every, anything to have a an automatic door moment. When you have an automatic door, then traditional door doors feel a little bit be lame. Or if you've had a touchscreen phone, you don't really want to go back to the push button phone. Not to mention the rotary phone. So we we have to bring this smart and sustainable uh, action. We have to bring adaptability. And we have to be uh, responsiveness and being convenience uh, to the customers as for, as as a group of businesses. Thank you very much uh, for, for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. OK, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, we'll uh, have questions later on. Um, the next speaker is Ms. Tulip Berenson. And uh, she is International Business Development and the CEO of uh, go for uh, Estonia. Um, Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here after, after previous speakers. So I will focus today on two things uh, that are very important for, for any successful digitalization journey. And these are balance and constant change. I try to bring as many examples as I can from, from very different angles to show why I think that these two things are the most important factors in, in any digitalization. But I will start with a bit of my background um, and already try to bring in some examples what to think of when we talk about digitalization. Uh, for some reason, yeah, now it's changing. So I'm Tuli. Uh, I have some experiences with the digital uh, transformation. Uh, I picked a few of those uh, also on the slide. Uh, I also prepared quite thorough slides because I thought that probably they will be shared after the program as well. So I hope I will have more ideas on the slides than I can talk about. So don't 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 let me disturbed about that. So my uh, uh, first contact with digital transformation was in 2008. And believe me or not, uh, things have changed a lot <laughs> in those 13 years. Um, in 2008, uh, I started as a director of development in, in one Estonian bank. And the idea was to replace our core banking system. Uh, and no one should do things today as these were done 10 years ago. Uh, then we developed a new system and then launched it on, on uh, in the beginning of uh, 2010 when uh, the euro conversion happened. Uh, everyone went successfully, no downtown uh, downtime. Um, euro was also converged and, and everything succeeded. But I never would recommend a similar waterfall approach that we develop something and then we implement it on one day. Uh, that's not the way how to build systems nowadays, but that, that was totally fine for 2010. Uh, the reason why I brought this example is to really show that no matter what is the change that you have in mind, it has, it has to fit into the context, it has to fit into the time uh, and into the capabilities that people have at that time and that moment. Um, after that, it might look like I didn't do anything, but actually I did one of the greatest achievements of my life. I gave birth to three sons in three years, so it might look on the slide that I didn't do anything, but it was great time of my life. Um, and after that, in 2014, I had the chance to um, work for Information System Authority in Estonia. Uh, at that time, we had a policy uh, made by Davi Kotka that all the core components of Estonian e-state have to be replaced because they're old. They're 20 years old, which means they need to go. Um, and actually, that's also one important thing to bear in mind. 
no one needs to do it the same way that we replace everything because they're old. But one core thing about digitalization is that our environment change, our needs change, uh, technology evolves, and we need to let go of some things for, for the new things to come. Uh, I won't talk in detail about XROAD and EID because uh, I know so already did, uh, but just mention what are these core components. These were XROAD, uh, the data exchange layer that is now implemented also in Estonia, in Finland and in Iceland and Faroe Islands, if we talk about European countries. Uh, the EID and um, we also had two very important core components. Um, uh, one is our state portal uh, and the fourth one is the management system for our distributed uh, information system. Because when you uh, decide to go for a distributed uh, information system like, like Estonia has, meaning that we have more than 200 or, and, uh, organizations who are connected every day and they have thousands of information systems that are connected then you need to have the overview of what's happening. You don't need to manage it because the contacts happen point to point, but you need to have the overview. And that's why we have the management system for our distributed information system. After that, I went to private sector into a telecom company, uh, Telia Estonia. Uh, and there the challenge was uh, that it had very good business strategy and it had very good uh, technology department. Uh, everything looked perfectly. The only concern was that technology department uh, and IT creation happened in two week sprints. So everything was very agile. Uh, DevOps were implemented superb by, by best standards that we know of. Um, and the same for strategy, but the strategy work and, and business development happened uh, on yearly basis. So the trick was there was how to bring those two parts of the same thing together. If there is half of the company that works in annual cycles and, and the other part of the company that works in two weeks uh, sprints, then it's not a question that they are not cooperating, but it's very hard to have a good communication if they have so different contexts. So how to provide a similar context for both so they could work together and better. Um, and now I am part of Gofora, who is a digital transformation company. And, and in Gofora, I'm mainly responsible for, for the international activities of Gofora. And that has once again given me many, many insights uh, about the importance of the context and what people are willing to accept. It's not only about the technology that's there, but what are we willing to accept today, here and now? Only a quick overview uh, of what Gopher does, uh, because I believe that gives you some, <laughs> also this context that why I talk about the things that I talk about and why I talk about those th this way. Uh, Gopher is a digital transformation consultancy who supports the customers, both in private and public sector, uh, all the way through their transformation journeys. Starting from the strategy and architecture work, uh, that is always, and I repeat, always uh, related to the governance and organization. Um, uh, we help to implement uh, the things that we have agreed that need to be implemented, and we help to uh, operate those. Uh, both from the personal training perspective and from the technical maintenance perspective. So for us, it is the same journey. And what we see happening very often, why, why it is hard to, to succeed in digital transformation is that these are considered as separate tracks that separate departments uh, have to achieve and do. The trick is not doing one single box on that picture and succeeding in that. The question is the balance between those, because even if that picture might look like architectural one, starting from top and then, then dealing with operations later on, then in practice all those things constantly happen and they constantly change. 
what you just said, I only can agree. Yes, you need to know what your mission is and what do you want to do. But I would even um, zoom in and say that it's very important that you understand what is the change that you want to see. If you understand very clearly what is the change that you want to see, uh, then it's easier to align different parts of your organization or when we talk about public sector, then cooperation between different organizations for the for the same change that we want to see happening. I also did some Googling work uh, to understand and bring out uh, the most common reasons and why why we want to digital digital why we want to start our digitalization journey. And the results are here. The biggest ones are the ones that repeat most often and the smaller ones are the ones that were not on the first page uh, of Google search. And I believe it's not a uh, new thing for you that the main driver we see is the efficiency and cost savings. Um, and I struggle with that one. I struggle with that one a lot because that contradicts with the idea of ever changing world. No matter the solution we build today, it will be outdated. We don't know if it's in one year, three years, five years, 10 years or 20 years or 40 years. But all the systems that we build need to be maintained and they need to adapt to the changing environment. So all those efficiency and cost savings that we will see and we will see them. Of course, we will see them. They are temporary. They support the processes that we have today. They have helped to change those, automate those, but they will need changes. So it's it's not you can never start the digitalization journey with the idea that I will do that for a year or two years or three years and then I stop, then it's done. It will never be ready. So of course you can always decide that I will do it more heavily in the next three years and then I understand that I need to reduce my capacity for digitalization and that's totally fine, but it's never ending. Uh, we always talk about quality. Yes, uh, with uh, digitalization we can uh, improve quality in the sense that more standardized solutions come out. But the smaller ones that we see on the picture are actually the ones that I find most relevant ones. <laughs> and these should be, uh, these uh, talk about this core of digitalization that yes, one day we are not able to find employees and staff who's, who are willing to work with us if we don't provide them suitable uh, working environment, meaning also digital working environment. I can talk about uh, one story uh, that we had in Information System Authority. Uh, back then we had this employee um, questionnaire that how satisfied are you with your workspace? And the top managers were surprised because, hey, why is the motivation so low? Why are everyone uh, even angry with the work environment? We just moved in to a new office space. We have good lighting, good working condition. Everything is perfect. Uh, and they didn't understand the concern until we said that, yes, but our mailboxes were torn for two days. Uh, we have we have that often because the same department who's responsible for keeping our e-state up and running is responsible for having our mailboxes up and running and these are never a priority. So understanding that this, this digital is physical is already there no matter if we accept it or not. And of course, the world is constantly changing and it will change constantly and it will never stop. And the change takes less and less uh, time than it used to. Totally. One minute, please. One minute. Um, I will move forward very quickly. I will uh, not talk about um, things, how a lot of things change, but only present one, one uh, model that we have created. There are several similar models out there. It's no matter what you choose. But all those digital transformation maturity models talk about the same thing and they say that it's never about IT or technology only. 
technology and data is only one part of, of the change that we want to see when we talk about digitalization. But as important factors are strategy and leadership, uh, the methods that we use, how our people operate, how we network. And nowadays we have added a new layer into that. And I see that our customers ask for it more and more. And this is this environmental aspect of it. How is this sustainable for the world around us, what we are doing here? And I will be happy to answer all your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for this, but uh, we need to move. Uh, um, thank you. Um, uh, Laura Alenius. Uh, it's our next uh, speaker. She works as a senior lead at CITRA, the Finnish Innovation Fund. Um, Laura, please. Thank you, and thank you for the very interesting keynotes. It has been a pleasure to hear them, and, and it is my pleasure to, to be a part of this really timely discussion. Uh, during the Finnish EU presidency, the human centric and fair uh, digital principles for the European data economy were introduced, and Citra was a part of, uh, was happy to be a part of helping the Finnish ministries to facilitate this discussion. And I'm really happy to see that the Portuguese presidency is also keeping the human centricity and the digital right on the table. So thank you for that. I will now uh, try to share my screen and let's talk more about the digital rights. So uh, can you see my screen? Yes, it is perfect, yes. Okay, thank you. So as a part of our Fair Data Economy project at Citra, we have been surveying the behavior and attitudes of Finnish and European citizens towards the data economy's current operating model. And our aim is to uh, introduce the concept of fair data economy into the public discussion and increase awareness of people, universal rights concerning data, and provide tools for people and companies to manage and benefit from the data that is collected on them. And uh, when I uh, talk about the fair data economy, uh, uh, as we see it, the current discussion around data seems to suggest that we must choose between data protection and data use and between benefiting people or benefiting businesses and between minimizing harm or maximizing benefits. In a fair data economy, as we see it, uh, we can both maximize data usage and innovations and at the same time protect our data. In other words, fair data economy benefits us all and needs of all stakeholders are taken into account. Um, in the digital space, we need to make sure that the same rights that apply offline can be fully exercised online. So the digital society should be also based on ensuring full respect of EU fundamental rights. Uh, digital compass introduces us the set of rights and principles on which we should build our digital societies on the coming years. We probably all agree that the timing could not be better as the global pandemic has opened the floodgates of digital transition that concerns every one of us. As we all have seen, online retail sales have exploded and even the Finnish uh, consumers have started to uh, buy online groceries. This was something that, that people were not believing was happening ever. So, and the video calls and audio meetings have become a primary channel of communication in business like this event today. We have learned to rely on social media to keep in touch with our friends and families and transactions with authorities take place online whenever possible. So the rights and principles that the digital compass introduced are very much to be welcomed. Still, I believe that something is actually missing. 
And the topic that is missing is individuals' control and right to benefit from the data collected about them. Too many Europeans and even businesses are much too unaware of the collect uh, collection of data. Uh, and most importantly, we don't have effective tools to benefit from the data collected about us. So, um, the guiding principle of digital compass that is still missing is actually data sovereignty. Uh, and by data sovereignty, I mean uh, the sovereignty of people and organization. The overall aim should be to nudge businesses and governments into giving their users, customers and people tools to manage, share and benefit from, the, from using their data. Uh, we at Citra believe that this will eventually also lead to new innovative services and economic growth. Uh, so, how could fair data economy look in practice with data sovereignty in place? I'll give you one example. As we all know, it's difficult to switch to a new social media platform, from example, switching WhatsApp to Telegram, because it means leaving all your existing contacts behind. The situation is similar that we had with mobile phones a couple of years ago when you could not, could not keep your phone number when you wanted to switch operator. And I think this was uh, really annoying. Uh, the similar effect is now restricting healthy competition, so it is extremely uh, difficult for new social media platform to attract enough members to gain critical mass. Data sovereignty would enable you to take your contact with you whenever you decided to move to another platform, leaving you free to take advantage of innovative or improved features and services from the new service. And here are some other examples of data sovereignty and the benefits of it. So, um, data has a lot of beneficial effect in daily lives and so societal level, but there is also a growing concern about the risk involved. Major platform companies, for example, have repeatedly been accused for the lack of transparency and the misuse of data in recent years. Uh, this survey commissioned by Citra uh, looked at how people are using these services and whether data leaks and abuses have eroded people's trust in services that collect and use data. The survey was conducted in four countries, Finland, Netherlands, France and Germany, and this was the second time we made this survey. The previous version of the survey is from 2018 and the more detailed results uh, will be published next month, but here are some sneak previews for you today. Uh, in our Fair Data Agony project, we have been uh, studying if introducing a digital trust mark could build further consumer engagement and positively shape companies' behavior and could this kind of trust mark support the creation of strongest market for responsible and ethical uh, technologies, products and services on the internet? So we ask Europeans uh, if this kind of label would be important for services that use data fairly. And 71% of, of the consumers agreed. So there is definitely demand for this kind of easy access labels and easy to use labels. But however, there is a still gap between the needs of individuals and the ones of the companies, and this is really important to understand. Uh, according to our survey, people's lack of trust in services can even diminish growth of digital business. 37 uh, of people say that lack of trust is an obstacle to using digital services and still companies have not invested in trust and transparency as a way to stand out. Less than a half of the companies uh, say there is a point in having a trust label and the interest has actually decreased since 2018. So there is a major difference between citizen needs and wants of the companies. So while the amount of available data increases exponentially every day, it is really important to agree on rules to use this data fairly and sustainably. 
building a fair data economy is in the early stages of its development and can only succeed through multi-voice social discussion. I'm really hoping that the discussion about the digital ethics and rights will reach both decision makers and common people as broadly as possible and force us all to consider the impact of data collection and its use on our lives. It is really important that digital ethics are included in the agenda of companies and governments before the trust of individuals is lost. Building trust takes a long time, as we know, but in the other hand, uh, the trust can be uh, destroyed in a moment. Uh, trust, on the other hand, is vital in a digital society to enable data to move and to allow new digital services that make our day-to-day -day lives easier to emerge. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really looking for the conversation. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, citizens' rights are, and ethics is, of course, one of the main uh, uh, important issue. Well, one of the important things that we ha will have to, to deal with uh, when we talk about data and uh, in our society, I believe, and, and for sure, uh, we need to, to, to have clear um, uh, rules about it uh, and, and try to figure out how to, to deal with, uh, with, with companies and also with citizens without uh, destroying the data, data economy that is needed uh, for Europe, I believe. That's my, my opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have much time for uh, Q&A anyway. Um, I don't know if there is any question uh, from our uh, audience. Yes, so I have one to see more. Let me see from um, for Professor Tim, um, Tim Rose. You mentioned the importance of coving knowledge about AI at all education levels, and I think it um, would be hard to disagree with that. However, do you have any specific news uh, as of now to popularize EU-wide and around the world initiatives such as elements of AI? How long will it take, do you think, for participation in such continuous learning to become commonplace? Professor. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's indeed a, a tough question. We have now uh, been able to uh, have something like 2% of the Finnish population, for instance, um, sign up on, on the course. Um, and we're approaching, I think, 1%. I think we have already in Croatia. I think they were quite uh, eager to, to take it on. Uh, and in other countries, we're, uh, we're still working uh, to reach uh, that 1% goal. But uh, like, I don't know, um, it, it's definitely hard and I don't think there is a magic uh, bullet or a simple solution to any of that. Our solution is really just to work hard on it and not work so that we just put stuff online and let it sit there. What we do is we create these partnerships with the local um, uh, local academic and uh, industry and government partners and have them you know go to i don't know libraries or or other like events that are taking physically or online place in in those countries and in those you know among the population that we try to reach it's it's really it's just like about all about hard work i don't think there's a there's a simple solution but but in anyways i think people are starting to appreciate uh, the, the need for lifelong learning more and more. And, and the fact that we have taken this digital leap in, in like uh, having these meetings and webinars and take, you know, going to school online will only accelerate that, uh, that uh, development. So, so I'm, I'm quite hopeful that gradually it will, uh, people will pick it up, um, but we need to work hard to, to help them and support them and encourage them to do that. I have a, another question for you, if you don't mind. It's, it's one of the things is, is regarding the, the lack of resources in Europe. Uh, you know that we have uh, huge problems on that, uh, but also basic digital uh, skills that is needed. We are talking about intelligent, artificial intelligence, but uh, we we lack uh, skills, ba basic skills in digital. How do you think you can? Um, 
uh, go forward and, and, and try to figure what is the, how, how can we manage this in, in Europe, uh, not just in Finland, but uh, in Europe? What is your opinion? Well, I, I think there's also, it's, 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 it's probably the same, you know, we just need to work hard. We need to offer it people in a, in a format that is approachable and we need to sort of do better service design in educational services that are intended for non, you know, not, not at schools or universities or other educational institutions, but just for people studying, um, you know, at home. It, it, it should be as easy as watching Netflix and it should be as fun and interesting as watching Netflix or whatever your, your favorite like uh, leisure time pastime. So I think that uh, attitude takes you pretty far in attracting people to to pick it up um, and then you then you just need to sort of make it uh, make it worth their, their while but I, I think the demand is there uh, we just need to need to work hard and uh, and we've been very surprised by how eagerly uh, people that are not the usual suspects of, of let's say digitalization related course so we've got like people the age age 90 is is i think the the record so far of, of people uh taking the elements of ai and and then we've had like teenagers or, or school kids taking it so it's yeah we just need need to get rid of the like the prejudice and the attitudes that prevent us from helping those people get on board and and sort of uh, bridge the digital gap uh it's it's not as as hard as we might sometimes think, but it's it's not also easy. So it's it's just about hard work. Yes, I agree with you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question for um, Mr. Uh, Avixo, um, for um, and also for Tuli Parenson. How laborious or even important, either politically or technically? Do you estimate it for uh, to be for EU member states to harmonize and compatibilize their own digital state services? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that um, this uh, Corona crisis has uh, taught us that uh, long debated uh, question whether there should be some competence at the EU level when it comes to health care services has become evident that if we want to be stronger, uh, if we want to build um, a, a Europe where citizens can truly freely travel and enjoy uh, the, the, the four freedoms, uh, and then this fifth freedom, which is also data, including health data, has to move freely as well. And, uh, and even though I have been a little bit critical about you know, what has been this very narrow scope of these digital vaccination certificates. This is only for travel purposes and the care continuity use case so that you would carry your health data with you. If you get vaccination in one country, you can get second shot in another country or later on in the, even other services. But I still think this is the movement to the right direction. I already mentioned that the spirit and the capability to collaborate in Europe does exist. So, uh, as I say to my politicians here in Estonia, I, I have the similar message to all the politicians in Europe. Just be more demanding. Citizens want it, it's in your hand, and it is possible. Thank you. And, and I would just add one part. Uh, I also think it's possible. I also understand it's, uh, it might not be easy, but um, I would add that there are some beliefs that have to change and they, that takes time because our beliefs can't be uh, changed with one law or any decisions. These are the things that we have to experience. And maybe just bringing one example, one of our beliefs uh, or, uh, and policymakers' beliefs is that no policy can support any single solution. But what is the other side of the coin is that, yes, but that means that every member state has to invent a wheel. So as we can't promote anything that's there already, then everyone has to invent a wheel. And, and I think that this belief is, is based on our understanding of the physical world and that we can't support one single enterprise. 
but when we talk about solutions that are created by, by Europe themselves, by public uh, authorities, no special gains attached, no one will receive money if anyone uses those, then we still believe that we shouldn't even promote this type of solutions. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another uh, question for Yusia Herlin. How much do you think the private sector should be involved in embracing the transitions vis-a-vis -vis governments in general? It is clear that both public, public and private sector uh, sides of this are important, but what question that remains concerns the importance of a private sector embrace of these transitions and how ideal they will manage to put the necessary capital into undertaking these transitional efforts, special, small and business, uh, medium uh, enterprises? Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, tough question. Uh, maybe it, it, it needs to be answered from a couple of different angles. Uh, in general, I think that the, the role of the government is to create create the playing field and and, and create the the environment and create the the, the circumstances in which uh, private sector can and work in the best way. Of course, and, and it needs to create the, the boundaries as well, so that we are looking that the government should be looking after the uh, looking after the benefit of of the of the people more widely, but um, so I think, you know, I think in terms of digitalization, I mean, companies are in charge of their own digitalization because because of the rules of competition, they will be left out, they will be left behind if they don't embrace it. So they have their own incentives to do that, um, especially for the large companies. Now, in terms of the small and enter medium sized enterprises, um, well, I think it, there are different ways in there are some ways in which a combination of, of uh, like private and public uh, inputs and, and investment uh, works best. And there are different ways in which the, 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 the uh, public funds can be channeled into the, into the private side for uh, targeted investment into digitalization and, and for example, Business Finland and, and or Academy, Academy of Finland, is that's what it's called in English, uh, are doing that uh, at the moment in Finland. And there are lots of, of course, of course, learnings on what the best way to do it. Um, and there are, of course, some some cautionary examples as well. So, you know, I don't I don't have a clear answer to that. I think that, you know, we need close cooperation. And from the perspective of our program and the perspective of the SMEs, I think what we need to do and what we have promised to do is to to have to really listen to the needs and and closely to the needs of the small and medium sized enterprises. What are the sort of rocks they have for for digitalization? What are the things that they would really? What are the first steps they would like to take if they have they just had sort of assurance that it is not a wasted step? So that this is not something that for the SMEs this can't be uh, led from the top. So this has to be a, a collaborative exercise. Okay, thank you. We have also a question for uh, Lara uh, Lenius. Uh, how feasible, in your estimation, is for an international and widely recognized standard of data sovereignty um, to be developed? How do you envision the political process leading up to this? Well, uh, if you see, the question for you see was complicated, so is this one. I think uh, one of the suggestions that Citra has made is that uh, the initiatives that are supporting the the um, sharing uh, data, like IDS and uh, Inopay's iShare, and that kind of initiatives should uh, do more collaboration and develop the needed uh, standards. Because as we know, with the uh, development of internet is not ready, so we should uh, continue uh, development of the internet standard standard in order to be able to de develop the needed uh, data sovereignty. So it's both technical thing, so we should develop some standards, we should do more collaboration with different kind of initiatives, and of course, there is also the political side. So I believe that the data sovereignty should be the base 
of the uh, new legislative initiatives in Europe, for example, the uh, Data Governance Act and the Future Data Act. I think the Data Act is actually really important to, to, to kind of uh, enable the, the creation of data sovereignty in, in Europe. <clears throat> Let me uh, ask you another thing regarding this, um, because uh, we talked about um, digital skills at the beginning of this session. And uh, do, do you think that uh, it, it is possible to uh, develop this uh, solution without digital um, um, skills from the citizens? Because they are the ones that will uh, have the choice to share the, the data, or share the information, the private information with others. What do you think uh, about this? Also, it's not just about regulation, but also about uh, citizens. Yeah, it's definitely about also the data literacy and the digital skills. And one of my dreams would be that we could have some kind of like them who has created like the uh, uh, elements of AI, we could have the elements of data which would, would promote the data sovereignty and the uh, what, it, what is the, the meaning of data in our society. So we need this kind of easy to access, really uh, uh, gamified kind of uh, concept. So I hope that we can talk with them a little bit more about this concept, but we also need uh, new services and I think the public sector is actually the one who should really stand out and start to uh, create those kind of services that would allow people to use their data. As we know the GDPR article 20 doesn't, uh, it's excluded the uh, public se sector out so the public sectors should take the lead and show what is the meaning of data for the citizens. So you're saying is that we are talking about uh, an ecosystem uh, and not just uh, uh, parts of the of that system. Uh, you need yes. to, to see it uh, holistically. Yes, um, definitely. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. I don't think that uh, are more questions. Anyway, I, I if we have we we, do, we are on right on time, but I have a, a question because we we talked about uh, skills, we talked about security. As, uh, security um, and privacy, we talked about rights, business and public sector. So we cross all the, the, the areas. My question is regarding the integrated uh, European data economy, because all, all the countries in Europe are related to, are, are, are integrated in this uh, vision. Um, I, I would ask each of you, if you in two minutes, uh, if you can, of course, uh, just to give us an highlight of, of your approach regarding the European data, data economy and all the, the relations between, again, skills, business, privacy, ethics, rights and the public sector. Thank you. I, we can start for, for, for um, you, you can start from um, with you, Laura, if you don't mind. I think I believe that I have been uh, discussing about this for so long. I would like to hear about uh, Ein's view because um, in this, uh, because we need the holistic view, and one thing that we are now missing actually is the data infrastructure, the needed data infrastructure. So I would like to ask about Tuli and Ain, that do you see that we are near to gaining the needed data infrastructure with, which would be uh, needed to, to have this kind of data sovereignty? What do you think? What, what do we need for that? I can say that, um, and I think this is uh, a very, very uh, good question at the very right moment. So the European health data space is a, is, is a noble goal, and I think it should be delivered. But I will also add that the digital sovereignty is, 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 isn't something that should be taken as a lip talk. Uh, digital services have this tendency to really converge towards, you know, the big ones who are already there. 
and and currently i think uh, the estonian sorry the european companies and and, and the same story is, is in estonia and finland and anywhere i think we need to support uh, the the idea that this digital infrastructure is in one hand the competitive advantage uh, that european companies would get but at the same time also to make certain that uh, there are you know policies and also a little bit of politics that supports uh, the this this development this will be a strategic goal and i don't think this is by no means uh, an easy task and i also don't think that making choices is ever easy but in the next decade i believe that the you know future of 21st century will be decided by those regions who have this infrastructure but also companies that are capable of making use of that. Thank you very much. Temu? Well, I think it's, it's such a broad question, but, uh, but my, I, I would simply sort of think, think big, think long term, and, and maybe sort of compare now the digital and the twin transition to the changes that we've seen in, in let's say environmental um, thinking and environmental regulation that that is that in which we are now much further in and now that wouldn't have happened if we had not been very ambitious if if you know the global um, uh, political and civil society hadn't been very ambitious in terms of environmental uh, protection uh, and now we need to be as ambitious as that in terms of our twin transition and transition is into our you know bringing that into how we think about sustainability in the digital world and i would simply sort of try to sort of uh, look for inspiration from that and and look for inspiration um, uh, in in making big changes and being ambitious and and europe obviously has the the moment now uh, we are ahead of uh, the kind of sustainability thinking in in terms of digital things um, in on the planet and I think uh, Europe really has to sort of um, seize this opportunity I, I just sort of I, I sort of I, I just want to connect everything that we've been discussing in into like like really far-reaching uh, and, and long-term thinking and, and seek inspiration uh, from there and of course build everything on education and and knowledge and and science Okay, thank you. Uh, Arixo? Sorry, you mentioned already. You see, Erwin? Thank you. Yes, um, maybe I'll build on what, what Temu said there earlier. So uh, a couple of things that I believe. One is that that I think Europe is is generally doing the right thing by not like not giving into big tech companies or or big tech governments from which from different sides of the world. So we are doing our own thing, which is respecting the, the rights of the individual, even if in the short term we're seeing that this is this makes it harder for harder to do business. So I think in a, in a very broad sense, this is the right way to do. And this is the sustainable way of of of, of going into a data data economy as well is that, that we, with respect to the rights of the individual. Um, so that's one thing. And I think that not only is it the right thing to do, but for well, well, maybe a, like a an anecdote from the elevator industry is that that actually the European regulations for elevators have are in use or have been taken into use in many parts of the world with little um, little or very small small um additions or or changes but except well us for example they have their completely their own regulations regulations for elevators which actually makes it much more uh, expensive to to have an elevator in the us but so we can also be a, a leader and showing that in a global context in how to how to regulate the, the collection and the use uh, of data as well and i think that we are in the, in the long run we are in the right path Okay, thank you. Uh, Tuli? I also agree with, with things that have already been mentioned, that I think that the EU has already shown that we are good at uh, creating the regulations that are put into force. And the 
the rest of the world might follow. <laughs> not maybe not all of them, but but a, a big part of the world. And even if if these are not uh, taken uh, in full, then still European regulation is often considered as best practice. Mm. What is the challenge on the way? Um, I think is uh, is once again similar to to many transformations that. Uh, are we aware enough to understand how this digital data differs from paper data that we are used to and how do we implement those regulations in a way that they really embrace uh, uh, the opportunities that the digital world allows us to embrace? Uh, I think that's, that's, that's <laughs> one of the things to bear in mind. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I believe that we are at the end of our session. Um, Lisa, unfortunately, can't uh, close the session um, for personal reasons. So it's up to me to, to close it. Um, thank you very much for uh, your presentations, for uh, your knowledge, uh, transfer knowledge. Uh, it was very interesting to hear all. all. I believe that the audience also uh, has uh, after. Uh, the same feeling that I am, uh, that I have. Um, so, um, I, I, just to finish, I, I would like to to thank you in in, in my name, in the in code 2030, uh, and Portuguese government for your time, uh, for your presentations, and um, for the conversation. I believe that we will could still be here for uh, just one more hour and uh, talked about all the things that we heard. And um, thank you very much for everything. And uh, let's uh, keep working and um, try to to figure out the best solutions for uh, all of the all the of the the stages. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, thank, you. thank you. Take care. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.